Thank you for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying he will not give up Israeli forces in a key area Hamas could use to rearm itself and possibly threaten Israel again. The dispute coming as the U.S. is still trying to work out a ceasefire deal. Even as the fighting continues in Gaza, many Israelis are returning home to places like the border town of Sterot. We're going to bring you an up-close and personal look. Facing charges of helping the Chinese communist government. That is the case against an aide to two governors of New York. And our Studio 5 conversation with actress Jennifer O'Neill, who plays Ronald Reagan's mother in the film Reagan. All those stories and more are ahead today on CBN Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. We begin this busy half hour on a Wednesday in Israel where Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is promising to protect the security of the Jewish state by keeping Israeli forces along a key area known as the Philadelphia Corridor by the Gaza border with Egypt to prevent Hamas from smuggling in weapons and quickly rearming itself and potentially striking Israel. That is a key issue as the U.S. is trying to work out a ceasefire deal while it also is going after Hamas legally. Julie Stahl has the story now. She's reporting from Jerusalem. The U.S. filed criminal charges against top Hamas leaders, signaling that America is no longer just negotiating with terrorists for a ceasefire deal, but is now out to punish them for their murderous crimes. Those defendants, armed with weapons, political support, and funding from the government of Iran and support from Hezbollah, have led Hamas's efforts to destroy the state of Israel and murder civilians in support of that aim. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland described in graphic detail Hamas's crimes on October 7th. They murdered entire families. They murdered the elderly and they murdered young children. They weaponized sexual violence against women. On October 7th, Hamas terrorists murdered nearly 1,200 people, including over 40 Americans and kidnapped hundreds of civilians. They perpetrated the deadliest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. The terror group's atrocities continue with the murder of six hostages last week, including Israeli-American Hirsch Goldberg Pauline. President Joe Biden said Hamas would pay for their crimes. Meanwhile, the U.S. says it's more urgent than ever to put together a ceasefire deal both sides will accept. We are working day and night to try to get an agreement over the line because we believe an agreement is manifestly in the interests of all the parties involved. The latest sticking point, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's insistence that Israeli troops remain on the Philadelphia corridor along Gaza's border with Egypt. Without an IDF presence, Hamas could resume smuggling in weapons and quickly rearm itself and once again threaten Israel. Still Philadelphia. Philadelphia corridor. This is the oxygen and armament of Hamas. This corridor is different from other corridors, from other places. It is central. It determines our entire future. Leading opposition Knesset member Benny Gantz accuses Netanyahu of overstating the importance of staying in the Philadelphia corridor. The Philadelphia corridor is an operational challenge, but is not an existential threat to the state of Israel. Iran's axis of evil is the existential threat to us. The issue causing an uproar in segments of Israeli society between those who demand an immediate hostage deal and those who believe defeating Hamas is the answer. According to the proposed deal, the first phase would be a six-week ceasefire requiring Israel to withdraw from the Philadelphia corridor and the release of Palestinian terrorists in exchange for 20 hostages in Gaza. Of the remaining 101 hostages, about one-third are believed to be dead. Israel is supposed to be able to re-enter the area if it needs to, but Middle East expert Caroline Glick says the Americans will prevent it. The fact is that the political realities dictate an American policy of not supporting a resumption of hostilities by Israel if Hamas breaks its word, which of course it will because it's Hamas. Meanwhile, Netanyahu called the U.K.'s decision to stop selling some weapons to Israel shameful. Britain's chief rabbi said it beggars belief that the U.K. would take this action at a time when Israel is fighting a war for its very survival on seven fronts. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. 
Even as Israel continues its military operations in Gaza, residents of border towns are cautiously returning home. Our correspondent Chuck Holton reports from Sterod, where life is slowly returning to normal despite the ever-present threat of another attack. Known as the bomb shelter capital of the world, Sterot has endured thousands of rocket attacks from Gaza over the past two decades. But following the October 7th attacks, the city of 34,000 was nearly emptied, with only 5,000 residents remaining. Now it's a safe. Now it's a safe because the Israeli army is inside and they don't let him to shoot to the Israeli settlements. This place where I'm standing is called the Sterot Lookout, and it's right about half a mile from the border with Gaza. It's the closest place that civilians can get to Gaza right now. And for obvious reasons, it has been uh, closed up until just a very short time ago, a few weeks ago. Uh, and that's because of things like this, the sniper's bullet coming and striking this window. Uh, this was a very dangerous place to stand uh, up until not too long ago. We can still hear the sounds of battle happening just right over there in Beit Hanun, the closest Gazan neighborhood to Sterot. But the Israeli government has decided that it is safe enough now for the Israelis to come back to this city. And that's because they have found the vast majority of the rockets and missiles that the Gazans were firing at the Israelis here in Sterot and have taken them out. So the number of rockets coming into Sterot is far lower than it was even before October 6th. Most of the, the people there are about, uh, yeah, 80 percent already. 80 percent are already back. While many are returning voluntarily, some residents are unhappy about the government's decision to end subsidies for internally displaced Israelis from Sterot. This has forced some to return despite ongoing safety concerns. The success will be when the, all the people which they are kidnapped to Gaza, they will be back at home. In addition to the returning residents, a few tourists are showing up, like these Indonesian Christian women who came simply to pray for peace in Israel. Today we here to pray as a Christian from Indonesia. We are pray for God will be safe this country and will broke all the enemy uh -huh. and destroy all the tunnel in Gaza and then bring the back all of the hostages. We pray for that. Since 2001, 27 people have died in Sterot from rocket attacks. In 2021 alone, Hamas militants fired over 3,500 rockets out of Gaza. Now, the city's upgrading its bomb shelters with bulletproof doors to guard against ground attacks. Residents say their ability to persevere through these challenges is what defines their community. As they rebuild, many hope for a future where sounds of peace will replace the sounds of war. From Israel, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Facing charges of spying for China, those are allegations against a top aide for two governors of New York. We're going to bring you the story when we come back. I'm Charlene Aaron. At CBN, we're here to pray for you all year long. But did you know that each fall, the entire staff of CBN sets aside a very special time to pray especially for you? We have seen tremendous miracles happen as a result of these prayers. Please call or send in your prayer requests today. No matter how big or small your need is, we consider it a great honor and privilege to pray for you. A former top aide who worked for two New York governors is facing charges of secretly helping the communist government and receiving millions of dollars in cash and perks in return. George Thomas has the details. Linda Sun walked out of a Brooklyn federal court charged with acting as an undercover agent for Beijing. The feds say the 41-year-old Chinese-born U.S. citizen used her position as former aide 
to New York Governors Kathy Hochul and Andrew Cuomo to directly help the Chinese government. She allegedly used her government rules to quietly push China's agenda. The 65-page indictment has Sun facing 10 criminal counts, including money laundering, visa fraud, trying to block New York state officials from meeting with Taiwanese government representatives, and changing some of the state's policy messaging to benefit the communist government's priorities. These actions reportedly gave China influence in New York's government for nearly a decade. Governor Hochul expressed outrage at the betrayal and said Sun was fired the moment misconduct was discovered. In exchange for acting as a foreign agent, Sun and her husband Chris Hu, charged as a co-conspirator, received millions of dollars in Chinese kickbacks, allowing the couple to splurge on multi-million dollar homes in Hawaii and Long Island, buy a 2024 Ferrari, enjoy travel benefits, tickets to events, and on 16 different occasions, reportedly got Nanjing-style salted ducks specially prepared by the personal chef of a Chinese government official. Brian Peace, U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of New York, said Sun wielded her position of influence among executives to covertly promote PRC and CCP agendas, directly threatening our country's national security. Prosecutors say Sun actively concealed that she took actions at the order, request or direction of CCP officials. This case is part of a broader effort by the Justice Department to uncover secret Chinese agents in the U.S. The couple pleaded not guilty to all 10 charges in federal court Tuesday afternoon. George Thomas, CBN News. Still ahead, investigating sexual abuse in the church. We're going to bring you a look at why abuse survivors say the Southern Baptist needs to do more to stop it. We've got the story for you right after this. For the last few years, Southern Baptists have been grappling with the issue of sexual abuse. A task force was put into place to implement reforms. But Charlene Aaron recently spoke with abuse survivors who say the denomination's actions do not go far enough. The SBC says preventing and responding to sexual abuse within its denomination is essential for the health of the church and its witness to the world. But a promised database to track accused abusers who often move from church to church has yet to be put in place. There's excuse after excuse as to why it can't be done. And no, no real action for reform. In 1998, Jules Woodson was abused by her youth pastor. For years, the SBC ignored or stonewalled victims like her. Two years ago, the nation's largest Protestant denomination finally faced up to the problem by launching a task force to implement reform. Its mission, to develop those resources and build a database of abusive pastors. In June, the task force disbanded with only half the job done, failing to produce the database that victims deem so important to holding abusers accountable and preventing future abuse. It's pretty discouraging. Uh, there wasn't a lot to come out of the annual meeting this year. David Pittman shares that disappointment. He was raped from the age of 12 to 15 by his youth minister. It's just a dog and pony show because nothing of, su of substance took place. However, the task force did make some progress, creating a curriculum for training church leaders to prevent and respond to sexual abuse. Chris Buckman said her work implementing reform was a revelation. Um, I think I fell into the camp um, a few years ago with a lot of people that said this isn't this isn't as much of a big problem as we think it is. But as I got into the task force and started working with churches um, and hearing more and more stories and how more common it is than not, um, I think that opened my eyes a lot. Pastor Brett Eubank of Petal First Baptist Church says that while the curriculum represents a move forward, more work needs to be done. It's not the, the, the end-all be-all. It's not the deepest thing in the world, but it tries to give churches some grasp, some handles on how they can address this issue inside their church so they wouldn't happen there. The SBC Executive Committee is reportedly working to implement the task force's recommendations. 
But Buckman says real change is likely to come from local congregations. As churches move through this curriculum, there's going to be questions, there's going to be eyes opened. And so um, we may hear more cases as people are discovering more of the bad actors in their churches. And so we're hoping oh. that yeah, it brings a lot of this to light and that they know how to deal with it when it comes. Meanwhile, Woodson and other survivors are frustrated. As far as having any really true hope for reform in the SBC, I'm very weary. A sentiment we, Eubank understands. It, it, we are as equally sometimes as frustrated um, that things have not progressed like we had. But what we do always want them to know is we have worked diligently and very hard to try to get those things across the board. Um, we do believe the database is going to happen. As the work to fight sex abuse in the SBC continues, some victims are beginning to lose faith in that promise. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Coming up, our Studio 5 conversation with actress Jennifer O'Neill about life on a horse farm and her role in the new film, Reagan. We've got the story for you when we come back. Introducing a brand new way to start your morning, the CBN News Quick Start Podcast. Each weekday morning at 7 a.m., get quick highlights of the day's important news, then an in-depth analysis that goes beyond the headlines, insights that matter to people of faith. Discover how God is moving around the world and here at home. Find the CBN News Quick Start Podcast on iTunes or wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts, because truth matters. Welcome back to CBN News Watch. Reagan hit theaters last weekend, earning nearly double its expectations at more than $9 million. In the film, actress Jennifer O'Neill plays the role of Reagan's mom. I traveled to her farm in Nashville. It is what gave birth to Hope and Healing at Hill and Glade, a beautiful horse farm. Born into a military family, Jennifer was inspired to serve America's veterans and first responders with therapy programs on this horse farm. She talks about the farm and her role in the film, Reagan. We're here in Tennessee. Yes. First, tell me about where we are. This is your farm? This is my farm mm -hmm. with my husband. Mm -hmm. um, we've been here 15 years. We do equine therapy for our heroes, our military first responders and their family, free of charge. So we work with Fort Campbell, Operation Stand Down, various organizations, the VA. Is there something that happened? What, what triggered this heart for the military for you? Well, it was my dad. Uh, my dad was literally a war hero. I read about him in World War II, uh, he, from World War II, mm -hmm. in books in school. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up uh, with TV shows like The Victory at Sea, loving our military, loving our country, mm -hmm. um, as we all should. So what pulls you away from doing that work to take on the role of Ronald Reagan's mom? Oh, multiple reasons. <laughs> I love doing it because of who she was and the impact that she had on this 40th uh, American president that made such a difference that people don't remember, especially our youth mm -hmm. uh, today, what a great man he was and what he stood for in his character. So that was emulated by his mother. She passed that along like a baton. Mm -hmm. She was uh, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. She was sure to make sure her two boys knew the Lord. I thought, wow, what, a, what an awesome woman to represent. How would you describe the relationship between the two of them? It was clear, at least from the film, that they were close. How would oh, you describe oh, their relationship? Join at the hip. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think uh, she was his director. Um, it's interesting, when he took the oath for president, he, he, um, he held her Bible that was open to 2 Chronicles 7.14. Uh, for those who are called in mm -hmm. my name, uh, if, if you pray mm -hmm. and uh, you repent of your evil ways, I will hear you from heaven. Yes. I will heal you and I will heal your land. Yes. What a thought for today. Well, she put a note in that bi Bible verse mm -hmm. next to it saying, Ronnie, this is great to heal the nation. Now that was, 
how long ago? <laughs> and we need it more now than ever. How important was faith to the Reagan family, especially growing up? How important was faith? It was integral. Mm -hmm. It was at the epicenter. God was at the head of the table. And the mother was the head of the family in the sense that his dad had some drinking problems. His brother had some drinking problems. So she carried the whole, uh, everything, the family on her shoulders and made sure that they knew who, who was God, who was the Trinity, who, the power of the Holy Spirit. In the middle of the scene I have with Dennis, uh, her at playing Nellie as the mother, she says, just be very careful to listen to that small voice, that whisper. Well, that's the Holy Spirit. Do you think his mom saw something in him, even at a young age, that there's something different about my child? From my understanding and study of her, she did everything to make both her boys uh, impactful. And she knew that the entire balance of their impact and their being would be based on their faith. There's nothing a retired governor can do, but a president. Now he can do a thing or two. Jennifer O'Neill is not only an actress, she has done work in modeling and written several books. Reagan is in theaters right now nationwide. Now be sure to join us for an all new edition of Studio 5 tonight. We're going to take a look at the film, The Forge. We're also talking to Bible teacher and actress Priscilla Shire, uh, who is making the return to the big screen in this new Kendrick Brothers film. Plus, we'll take a look at the inspirational film, You Gotta Believe. It is the true story of a little league team. They were underdogs when their coach found himself in the fight of his life. You can catch this all new episode of Studio 5 on the CBN News Channel. It begins at 8 Eastern. You can also watch it on the CBN News app or on YouTube. Time now for your Wednesday word and today's word is trust. And with that, I say trust in the Lord with all of your heart, trust his hand and trust his heart. Even when you feel like you can't trace him, he is there standing ready and willing to help heal and to deliver hope. With that word, I trust this will be a great Wednesday for you. That will do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. You can always find more of our news programs on the CBN News Channel. You can find them there at any time as well as online, cbnnews.com. Take a moment. Let us know what you think about the stories you've seen here today or any day. You can email us, newswatch at cbn.com. You can also reach out and touch us on Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly known as Twitter. We'll see you back here tomorrow.